Hello, it's Scott Medley here, and I'm standing next to a model of an astronaut. Why? Because I'm standing in the middle of Meteor Crater, and Meteor Crater is the world's best preserved impact crater, and it's where the Apollo astronauts spent a lot of time training, learning about impact geology. So I've had a chance to come down here with a, a number of researchers and learn a whole lot about this amazing structure. So this amazing trip was organized by the B612 Foundation and the Asteroid Institute, which are basically nonprofits that make it their mission to save the world from the possible eventuality of a killer asteroid. And going into Meteor Crater with a number of researchers who are working on the problem is a fantastic way to learn more about it. Meteor Crater is probably the most recognizable crater in the world, the most well-preserved. It's not the largest, it's not the most recent or the oldest, but it is in exceptionally good condition. And it's very easy to recognize this as something that looks like it could have formed on the moon, other than the fact that there's a lot of greenery right now because they've recently had a lot of rain. So the crater is about 1.2 kilometers across and 170 meters deep. That's a three quarters of a mile, 500 and something feet deep. And it was formed about 49,000 years ago by an iron asteroid, maybe 50 meters or 160 feet across, massing over 300,000 tons. And while we weren't there, we can actually take models of nuclear blast craters and we can model asteroid physics and try to fit it to what we see in terms of not just the top structure, but the structure underneath the crater. So current models have a best fit for an object that was about 50 meters across, 160 feet, traveling at about 15 kilometers per second at an angle. That would have had an energy of about 18 megatons, but on the way through the atmosphere, it loses a bit of that and material gets you know, sheared off just due to aerodynamic forces. And so the energy that was deposited into the ground to make this crater was about 10 megatons, or the equivalent of 10 megatons of TNT. Now that was 50,000 years ago, but about 100 years ago, there was uh, an impact event that was of similar energy. Up in Tunguska in Siberia, uh, an object came down and it broke up inside the atmosphere. And the amount of energy that was released by Tunguska is about you know 10 to 20 megatons. It's estimated based upon the hundreds of square miles on kilometers of forest, which were just laid flat by this blast. And the difference between these two events all comes down to what the incoming asteroid was made of. In Tunguska, it was something that was a rubble pile that disintegrated and deposited its energy in the air. In Meteor Crater, it was a much more solid chunk of probably solid iron, which went in like a bullet. And as it hit the surface, it was rapidly decelerated. And that causes a shock wave inside the object, which vaporizes most of it. And then the whole thing essentially explodes outwards. And in do so doing, of course, lifts up this massive hole in the ground. Because it's a research site, it's actually very rare to see people in the middle. So the people that run Meteor Crater, they actually have a model of an astronaut down in the middle of the crater. And you can just about make it out here on the, the right there next to that American flag. And since we were in the crater, we could do this from the reverse angle. This is Ariel Waldman, a citizen scientist. And up there on the very edge of the crater is the visitor center. And as we zoom in, you can see people standing up in the viewing gallery, wondering what kind of science we are doing down in the crater. Another interesting data point for scaling is the size of the object that created this crater. So this is a map and this red dot is how big that asteroid was. The energy per unit mass of an object moving at about 15 kilometers per second is almost 30 times the energy per unit mass if it were made of TNT. So that massive release of energy does an interesting thing to the geology of the area. There's a standard rule in geology called the rule of superposition that says that newer rocks are laid down on top of older rocks. But this giant explosion actually flips this over in reverse. The material has been flipped upside down so that as you descend into the crater initially, you start going from older rocks towards younger rocks. And then at a certain point when you're at the level of the original uh, landscape, you start going down in towards the, the older rocks again. But this actually took a while to demonstrate because you can't actually radiologically date sedimentary rocks. And the truth is, the thing that geologists got interested in first wasn't the sedimentary stuff, it wasn't the structure, it was the iron. 
right? And this is one of the largest chunks of iron recovered from around the crater. In the late 1900s, it was realised that there was a lot of iron being found near this crater, and that the iron was meteoritic iron. It was something that has the peculiar crystalline structure of something that has been uh, cooled over millions of years. It's not something that can be made by people or form on the surface of the Earth. While many geologists thought that the crater was probably formed by a volcanic explosion, there was a mining engineer that had a different idea. So one of the big names in the history of Meteor Crater is Daniel Barringer, who he basically bought it a long time ago thinking that he might be able to mine iron from it. His, um, his logic was that they'd found lots of iron scattered around this big hole, and whatever event had caused this hole very likely meant there was a lot of iron in it. So he hired miners who worked for years digging deep shafts, looking around the interior of the crater to find this giant mother load of iron that would make him rich. Unfortunately, they didn't find it. This whole thing turned into a literal money pit. And so eventually he died and the crater went, was passed on to his family and they started sort of treating it like a tourist attraction, charging people 25 cents to take a look inside this crater. And that's what we have today. Barringer's mistake was in thinking of the asteroid as if it were a large bullet. And as you know, if a bullet hits a target, it can embed itself inside the target. But bullets move at supersonic speeds. Asteroids are moving at tens of times this. Uh, they have so much kinetic energy that if you convert that kinetic energy into heat, it will literally vaporize the object. And so what happened was the material was spread out across the area and some sections survived. Some of the larger objects we find, such as that large meteorite, that probably cleaved off as the object entered the atmosphere and then it came down following it. And there's quite a lot of these larger objects that actually show evidence of being shocked by the shockwave generated by the impact. As in, as they were coming down, the shockwave travels up and hits them and transforms them further. Anyway, there's a lot of evidence left of the mining workings at the bottom of the crater, a lot of hardware, and you have to imagine this had to be carried down through some very unforgiving terrain and frequently in very unforgiving weather. And there's a large shaft in the middle of the crater which goes way, way down. You can't see the, the bottom of this, but as I understand it, if you could, there would be pieces of an aircraft in there. In 1964, a pair of pilots flew a Cessna 150 over the crater, and the shape of the crater had trapped a large bubble of hot, low-density gas, and that meant that they suddenly lost lift and descended into the crater unexpectedly. So they were trapped in a region where they had less lift than they expected. They tried to circle the crater to pick up speed, but eventually just lost control, stalled, and crashed into the crater. Thankfully, the crew did survive, but with serious injuries, they had to be stretchered out uh, along that very precarious path. Now, that wasn't the end of the story. The wreckage was still there, and pilots would occasionally radio in that there was a plane down, to the extent that the people at Meteor Crater decided it was a good idea to hide it, and they threw most of the plane's fuselage and wings into that uh, mining shaft. This is the only piece that's left and it is actually visible from the visitor center if you look carefully. There's a pair of fairly large boulders in close proximity and if you look to the right of one of those, you can just about see it there sitting, uh, sitting exposed. Those boulders are, of course, a very obvious example of the erosion that has happened over the last 50,000 years. These are things that you can see that have fallen in, but the entire crater was much deeper after its initial formation, but the weather has caused a lot of erosion and material to infill it and make it you know, more shallow over time. And you can see evidence of the recent rains in this uh, surface in the bottom of the crater. You know, about 25,000 years ago, there was actually a lake in the crater. It was actually one of the first estimates of the age of the crater because they found shells that had been deposited there by you know animals that had lived in this lake. And those were carbon dated to 25,000 years ago. And it took a lot of other similar radiological dating to actually really you know figure out the exact date that this event happened. Now, Determining there was actually an asteroid impact crater, while Barringer had his suspicions based on the meteoritic iron, it was Gene Shoemaker who proved it conclusively. Shoemaker had previously studied craters formed by nuclear blasts, 
And what he found was evidence of quartzes that had been crushed into higher density states. I think stichovite is one and coosite is another. These are basically types of quartz that have crystalline forms only produced at extreme pressures, the kind of pressures you get when a shockwave traverses through the rock and crushes these down into the higher density states. And those quartz phases are not found in volcanic eruptions. Volcanic eruptions can produce craters of this size, but they can't produce the shock-induced pressures that you get associated with nuclear blasts or hypervelocity impacts. And Gene Shoemaker would be an expert on craters, and he would identify many of them over the world. And for a time, he was a candidate to be part of the Apollo program, but unfortunately never made the cut for health reasons. But he did train many of the astronauts, and the astronauts that went to the moon spent time at Meteor Crater learning about how to do geology, and that's one of the reasons why they now have this statue of an astronaut here that some poor Meteor Crater employees had to drag down in the middle of the summer. When I visited five years ago, it was just a plywood cutout, but now they've got an actual 3D model. And I believe that NASA still occasionally uses this for training and testing suits. There may be some plans to do that later this year. So, you know, for me, for me, Meteor Crater is this incredible monument that just basically shows the power of asteroid impacts. And I should make it clear, this is a very small object. This is a 50 meter object that produced a localized, uh, you know, crater, which would, you know, affect areas for miles around, but it wouldn't have a massive effect on the Earth in general, but if it landed in the wrong place, yes, that could be a problem. For the very large objects that could you know, cause a mass extinction on Earth, thankfully we have been able to catalogue almost all of those and we now know their orbits, we know that they're not going to hit us. For smaller objects that could cause destruction on the scale of a city or perhaps even a country, those still have large numbers that we're not sure about. and. It's possible that one day we do find such an object and may have to figure out how to deal with it. And that may sound like something out of science fiction, but it's something we're actually going to do in the next year. This November, a space mission called DART, the Double Asteroid Redirect Test, is launching. And it is going to crash into a, an asteroid called Dimorphos. It's the moon of another asteroid called Didymos. So Dimorphos has a mass that's probably about 10 times that of the one that made Meteor Crater. It's three times its diameter, and we're going to hit it with this spacecraft and change its orbit to demonstrate that we could do this if it was necessary. But more importantly, just finding all the objects in the solar system that could potentially pose a threat is far more important. And that's what B612 and the Asteroid Institute are currently pushing for. And if that's something you can get behind, maybe you should check them out and possibly become a supporter. Uh, or if you're interested in going to Meteor Crater, it is off the side of Route 66 near Winslow, Arizona. And you can't get to go into it. You can, I believe, get guided tours of the, the crater rim. And they have a nice little space museum there in general. They actually have a um, one of the boilerplate test capsules that was used in the Apollo program. So yes, that was Meteor Crater. It's one of my favorite places in the world and I'm glad to have shared some of it with you. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.